Good evening, and welcome to the first workshop in the EU series focus this semester. This series was created to give students an introductory level understanding on the European Union, its history, how it works, and its role in the global economy. My name is Claudia Saracita, and I am the student coordinator for the series. I was fortunate enough to participate in last year's series and trip to Brussels, and it's been one of my favorite learning experiences with La Pietra Dialogues and NYU Florence. This evening, Professor Nicolo Conti will be discussing EU institutions and decision-making processes. Nicolo Conti is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University Unitel Massapienza of Rome. He has taught in international programs at the University of Siena, Georgetown University Florence Center, and FIT State University of New York Florence campus. His main research focus is on parties, elites, cabinets, and the EU. He has recently edited Party Attitudes Towards the EU in the Member States, Parties for Europe, Parties Against Europe, The Challenge of Coalition Government, The Italian Case and Perspectives of National Elites on European Citizenship. He's also my professor here at NYU Florence, teaching a course on comparative politics, and it's been my pleasure to work with him on this series. Professor Conti. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. That was very nice of you. It's my pleasure to be here today and also I'm particularly grateful because I didn't know that um, this place could be used for lectures. I feel very privileged. I thought it was just made for reception, so I think it's a very nice place to be. Um, today I'm going to um, introduce you to uh, the uh, institutional system of the European Union. It's quite a tough job, I have to say, um, because the European Union, and in particular its institutions, do not compare to any other institutions existing in the world. Usually what we do when we don't know something is to compare, to compare to what we already know. But because the European Union institutions are so special, you will see it's really very difficult to find points in common with either the United States or Italy or any other country you may know. So, the challenging thing when approaching the EU institutions is really to wear different lenses and try to start think differently. What seems to be nonsense exists at the European level. Uh, what seems to be really, uh, let's say, unpractical, irrealistic, well, seems to exist at the European level. And there must be reasons for that. I mean, if the European Union system is, in a sense, so unique, there must be reasons for that. And of course, there can be criticisms about the thought that something so, um, let's say, difficult to exist, to work, is something that is bound to failure. But who knows? I mean, in the end, we are living these days a time of peace. In particular, those countries that belong to the European Union have been in peace since the European Union process. It was not the case before. The European continent was known for being a continent of Wars, battlefield, always. Some wars took a hundred years between the French and the British, or it was between the French and the Germans. Um, always Europe has been a battlefield. Um, just at the time of the Roman Empire, um, a large part of the continent, but not only the European continent, also the north of the Mediterranean, uh, um, yeah, the north of um, uh, the Middle East, so the north of Africa and parts of the Middle East, um, were part of this empire. And that was the only time of relative peace, uh, but otherwise, uh, within the European continent, there has always been war. And don't forget that during the uh, last century, the First and the Second World Wars, are wars that started here, uh, exactly with uh, the tensions between Germany and France. So, uh, in the end, if we are living a time of peace, uh, you see, if those countries that belong to the European Union um, do not have serious problems with each other. I mean, there are problems concerning how they should accommodate their economies, um, their different interests in trade and so on. But never this develops into war. Never this develops into conflict. Look instead what happens just at the border. 
in those countries that do not belong to the European Union. There has been a civil war in the former Yugoslavia in the in the 90s, and finally Yugoslavia just imploded and does not exist anymore. There are problems now in Ukraine. So, it seems that really the European Union is giving protection to um, those countries that do have problems. I mean, we have plenty of countries that do have problems of, uh, uh, let's say, ethnic minorities, internal divisions, and so on. But uh, never within the European Union this has developed into war. Not war within countries, no war between countries in the European Union. So, in the end, um, despite it could seem weird, we are living in a place that makes peace one of its main goals, that makes integration among many different countries of small size, because, I mean, you see the European continent is quite small, but overcrowded with states. So imagine if there was not an order, there would be anarchy. And as it was in the past, probably every state would be aggressing the other. So the European Union in the end seems to be um, giving a sort of umbrella and protection to all these different states to flourish together. So this was just the beginning because now we go into more uh, a tough job which is to uh, describe the European institutions and uh, the way they work. In particular we do this because we're interested to know how decisions are made at the European level. Uh, if we think of um, the United States, for example, we think of the American government, we know that there is a pre president, we know that there is a legislature, a congress, and we know that these are the two main uh, bodies that make, uh, that make decisions. Uh, sometimes the uh, process works smoothly, some other times it's more tense, but in the end, we know what we're talking about. So who makes decisions at the European level? Has, have you, has any of you heard of a president of the European Union? Has any of you heard of a um, member of the parliament of the European Union? Is there any prominent politician at the EU level that you know? Probably not. So this is already a sign. Mm? It seems that when we approach the European Union, we should not expect extraordinary, charismatic leaders. Probably we should expect something different. So, like in every, uh, like in every system, uh, you need to um, accommodate executive and legislative politics. That's a principle of democracy. You need to have executive and legislative politics that are separated. That's one of the basic principles of modern democracy. This is then created in different ways depending on the country. Like in the United States, for example, with the presidential system, we have separation of powers between president and Congress. They're separate. Both institutions have the popular legitimacy through the vote. And so, no one can dismiss the other. They have to, to do together, they have to coexist. In other countries, parliamentary systems like Italy, but there are also some that are probably better known, like Britain, well, in parliamentary system, the executive is fused to the parliament. So the citizens only vote once for the parliament. And once the parliament has been created, the majority in the parliament creates a government. In this case, the government is, the executive is fused to the legislature. This is the parliamentary system. And these are the two main institutional systems that we know in democracies. Now, does the EU associate to any of the two? Not at all. Is there a name for the EU institutional framework? Not at all. Nothing that we can't theorize. We can't theorize because it's unique, but also because it's also a moving target. The institutions of the EU today are not the same. They used to be even 10 years ago. So imagine 20 or 30 years ago. So, 
um, I don't want to go uh, too much into history also because this is a um, topic that will be covered um, in the next of this lecture series by Professor Lombardo, but let's have a picture of um, the EU institutions nowadays. So, we need to accommodate executive and legislative politics. How does it work? We have three main institutions. These are the European Commission, the Council of the EU, and the European Parliament. So, keep these three names in your mind. These are the three main decision-making bodies in the EU. Let's say that, to simplify, you could conceive the Council of the EU and the European Parliament as two chambers of a Congress. So if you think of the American legislature with two chambers, House and Senate, well, you may think of European Parliament and the Council of the EU as two chambers of a legislature. So what happens in the American Congress? Well, MPs decide over legislation, right? They make decisions, they pass bills, the health reform, the budget, but also, let's say, more, more middle rank or, let's say, micro policies, not necessarily um, policies of same standards as the health reform or the budgetary policy. But it is important to keep in mind that before a decision becomes law, so it becomes binding within a state, there needs to be a legislative vote, so a vote within the Congress. Now, the Congress at the European level is made by these two chambers, European Parliament and the Council of the EU, and so they co-legislate, as the House and the Senate do in America. So, any time there is a decision to vote on, any time there is, let's say, a proposal to change things, to decide over a particular policy field, it could be any field, it could be trade, it could be competition, it could be agriculture, but it could also be education, it could be the environment. Well, it takes the vote of both the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. There is only a few exceptions, but in over 90% of cases, this is done through co-legislation, co-decision. There is a number of reserved areas where it is only the Council that votes on, in particular foreign policy. I will explain you later why. Now, if this is the legislative, we miss the executive. So where, where is the executive? Who leads? Because usually the executive is leading the process. So it's very difficult to think of an executive at the European level that is charismatic, that is personalized. It's very difficult to associate executive politics with a single person, as it would be with a president in the United States or a prime minister in a parliamentary system, because there is not. You can be surprised about that, and many say, well, this is one of the reasons why the EU is so weak. Never the EU can take major decisions, because if the EU lacks um, if he lacks personality, if he lacks legitimacy of a leader, if he lacks leadership, how can a body of over 500 million and including 28 member states decide over the more contentious issues 
either the economic crisis of what to do with Russia, uh, if Russia attacks Ukraine, uh, what to do with ISIS in Iraq. I mean, how could you possibly have leadership at the European level if a leader is missing? Well, but do you think it could be easy to appoint a leader at the European level? I mean, we're a, we are a supranational entity of 28 member states. And the number of languages that is spoken is, at best, 28. It's true that some countries share the same language, but it's also true that in many countries you have more than one language. So, we have an enormous number of languages, cultures, but also political cultures. There are big states, small states. Imagine how difficult it is to convince a country as small as Estonia or Latvia or Slovenia not to talk about Malta. Do you see Malta? It's a wonderful, tiny island in the Mediterranean. It is a state on its own. It used to be a military basis of uh, the um, British in the past. Then it became independent. Well, 350,000 inhabitants, a state. Imagine how difficult it would be for the Maltese to accept to vote for a president who would never be Maltese, for sure. And as just a small people, they would have, in a sense, to succumb to the rule of the majority. Countries like Germany, 80 millions, Britain, 60 millions, Italy, 60 millions, France, 60 millions, Spain, 35. And then you have countries of 350,000. It makes a big difference in size. So, so how could you convince these countries to vote for a president and accept that the president will never be someone from their nation? Difficult. So, the European Union is very often about what cannot be done, more than about what can be done. So, we have no leadership at the European level, and that's a problem, but we need at the same time to run some kind of executive politics, because if the legislature is there to decide over bills, there must be someone who implements the bills, who gives a line and also monitors that these bills are then implemented at the national level by the member states. So the institution that is entitled with this power is the European Commission. So you can think of the European Commission as best approximation of an executive. The European Commission uh, doesn't have strong political leadership. Uh, the European Commission is made of um, representatives of the member states. I'll come back to this later on, but this is just to, let's say, um, make clear, don't expect big names there. I mean, if you can't think of any president of the European Commission, that's more than normal. Even many Europeans don't know. <laughs> okay, so don't get frustrated for that. So the European Commission is there because in the European Commission lies the um, technocratic expertise. The European Commission is organized in different uh, um, directorates. Each directorate has competence in a certain policy field. There you have the highest level of expertise you could find maybe in the whole of Europe in the different policy fields. So you have bureaucrats, you have, uh, you have technocrats, and they are coordinated by chiefs that we call commissioners, who are appointed by the member states. Not always these, these chiefs are as expert as their staff, 
but the staff is again very much qualified in the different policy fields so executive politics legislative politics how the mutual relationships work First of all, let me tell you that the role of the European Commission is crucial because the European Commission is, by treaty, the only body that can initiate legislation. So it's the only body that can initiate the decision-making process. So, despite European Parliament and the Council of the EU apart of the European legislature, this legislature is not autonomous in the sense that they can't start the legislative process if it is not the European Commission that issues a proposal. Very tricky, it seems strange, but there are explanations for that. First of all, the European Commission has this expertise that is necessary because you're dealing with um, a supranational entity which is very complex, policy fields that are very complex, and this of course is true uh, in, every, in every single state, but you know, dealing with 28 member states and 500 million and over, some of which are uh, among the most advanced economies and some others are not, you know, it takes quite a lot of technicalities. And so this technical knowledge is within the European Commission and not within the European Parliament nor the Council. So, the European Commission has this broad view. Uh, the European Commission is meant to be the real supranational institution, the garanta of supranationality. Yeah? So, uh, the idea that um, if you issue a proposal, it's not in the interest of you know, a single part, it has to be in the interest of the whole of the European Union. And the European Commission is the institution that holds this, this mentality. Um, so, the European Commission issues a proposal that is then voted by the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. And it takes the positive vote of both chambers in order to be passed. Does it mean that the European Commission, let's say, can um, take, uh, let's say, can, can kidnap the other institutions? Well, no, because the European Commission is there to listen to everyone. So if the European Parliament pushes for a proposal, then the Commission should think of how best this proposal could be drafted, but uh, it would be very inconvenient for the Commission to refuse to process a demand that comes from the other institutions. And as well, demands can come from other bodies. It can be interest groups. Uh, you see, for example, this Economic and Social Committee and Committee of the Regions. These are just advisory bodies. They do not figure among the main institutions of the EU, but they are advisory bodies that are competent in uh, um, issues of uh, uh, business and work, and on the other side, on uh, issues of uh, uh, territorial differences and cohesion. And so they also gave some um, recommendations to the European Commission uh, to be then transformed uh, into draft proposals. So, the European Commission issues a proposal. Uh, this has to be done in a way that is uh, wise. Uh, it doesn't have to be partial. It has to think uh, of the interest of uh, everyone, in particular all the member states, and then this is voted by the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. Is there any questions so far? Yeah, do we have a microphone? Um, I just want to know what is the main difference between the Council of the EU and European Council? Okay, so uh, composition of these three different bodies. As I said, uh, on the side of the Commission we have technocrats who are bureaucrats. They work there on the basis of a permanent position that they have. They pass a selection and they are recruited. 
there is also, let's say, national um, quota that need to be respected. So, I mean, not only they have to look for the best experts, but also once this expert has to be Lithuanian, another time it, uh, he has to be, she has to be Polish, and you know, let's say quota, national quota. Um, on top of this bureaucracy, there are. Um, uh, commissioners who are appointed by the member states. Each member state appoints one and then depending on uh, um, the kind of expertise these people have, they're assigned to a different field, a different portfolio. It could be again education, environment and so on. And then there is the president. That's really the chief um, of this executive body and uh, the president is elected again by the member states in the sense that the member states meet, sometimes they have to meet several times in order to decide a name. He will not be a leader, he will be more of a coordinator. He will not be someone who has his own agenda to process and, you know, who has popular mandate on the basis of that agenda, not really. So the member states will have to decide who's more suitable for that role at that particular moment in time. Not only this, um, this guy has to go through the ascent of the European Parliament. So there needs to be uh, there needs to be some kind of coordination between the member states and the European Parliament. Is that clear? So that's the Commission. Then let's move to the European Parliament. The European Parliament is, within the uh, institutional framework, the only body that is directly elected by the citizens. The only one. So we vote every five years. Uh, elections are a little bit strange because, I mean, we vote for a European Parliament, but really we vote for um, our national candidates, so our national representatives in the European Parliament. And so, um, I mean, it is a Europe-wide election, but at the same time it's a national election. But um, you see there are obstacles to make it really supranational because uh, imagine having candidates from a different country campaigning here. In what language should they campaign? What knowledge would they have of the constituencies? So it's really kept national, but in the end, all national representatives add to form the European Parliament. This is then divided into, um, not into national lines, but instead it is divided into um, parties, big parties, left, right. So once they join the European Parliament, they decide what party to belong to, depending on their ideology, which is interesting because despite these people do not really campaign together, um, once they reach Brussels, they have to decide uh, who to stay with. Okay, and then the Council of the EU, this is made of the ministers of the member states. Ministers. Um, let's say uh, in America, this would be under secretaries. This would be um, the key figures of the presidential administration, okay? So in the um, European member states, we have ministers who deal with the different policy fields. Again, the one before, environment, education, uh, interior, health, and so on. So these ministers, of course, have to do their job at home. They can't be all the time in Brussels but they meet with their fellow colleagues from the other member states once in a while in Brussels to decide, let's say, to, to discuss, to discuss uh, their common agenda and to decide over legislative proposals. Those that have been issued by the Commission, you remember. So, complicated, isn't it? But not totally crazy. Because what you have at the European level is national interests, is also political differences, but there is also a need of 
expertise, technocratic expertise, and this is all represented in these three different bodies. So, the commission that is technocratic issues proposals that are well drafted because of the expertise they have, but then this is reviewed by the two chambers of the legislature that have one political orientation, left, right, and the other one, national interests, ministers from the member states. So imagine, for example, that um, under the pressure of environmental groups, the European Commission issues a draft proposal about limiting pollution. And this draft proposal is very much appreciated by the European Parliament that has a leftist majority. But then, when the draft legislation goes to the European Council, sorry, the Council of the EU, sorry, that was a mistake, well, there the Germans start to say, fantastic, but this will have an impact on our industry. I mean, this is not a problem for, let's say, Greece that doesn't have the same kind of industry. It's not a problem for Spain because they don't have either. It is a problem for us. So this is very negative for our national interests. We don't want it. We have to change it. We have to redraft it. So you see, it starts as technical and many good wishes. It becomes political through the European Parliament, and finally, it becomes national under the Council of the EU. So this is the process. And if there is no agreement, there is a swift between a chamber and the other until a certain point. Because the Council proposes to change and then sends back the draft to the European Parliament who has to decide again and send it again back and so on until a certain point, because then if they don't find agreement, they just skip it. They just throw it away. Sometimes it happens. Okay, so this is, um, in a few words, how the decision-making process works and how the different um, institutional bodies are um, formed. Have I answered your question? Now, you see that there are still some empty boxes. There is the European Council and there is the European Court of Justice. The European Council, what is it? First of all, you see there is this very bad wording, Council of the EU, European Council, even myself, I made a mistake before, because it's a bit confusing, but it seems that we don't have, you know, um, enough words <laughs> uh, to call all the different institutions. Probably there's too many. As a matter of fact, the European Council did not exist at the beginning, was not there from the very beginning. Um, it started as an informal meeting of um, national leaders, chief executives from the member states. So today it would be Angela Merkel, Renzi from Italy, Cameron from Britain, Hollande from France, so chief executives from the member states. It started as an informal meeting because there were many, many things, many urgent matters to discuss. I mean, integration gets deeper and deeper over time. It started in the 50s as a very tiny thing. They decided to integrate just a small energy sector and then it has spilled over in something completely, you know, different. Now it covers uh, the monetary policy, um, fiscal policy. Uh, it also has um, cultural implications on our education system. Um, it also has huge impact on health and welfare. So, I mean, now, uh, the integration process has become, you know, like a snowball that grows and grows. That's what, what, what it is. And uh, many observers say that uh, between 50% and 70% of the decisions that are taken at home 
actually derive from European decisions, either directly or indirectly. So we depend really to a large extent, the scope of maneuver of the member state has become really narrow, so important um, the European Union has become. So you understand there was a need to give guidance, leadership, to decisions in the different fields, and certainly the President of the European Commission could not do that. Someone who's not directly elected by the citizens, who doesn't have a, a popular mandate, someone who is appointed by the national governments, you know, very indirect appointment. So that's why the leaders of the member states, the political leaders, decided to step in and to meet, first informally, but then, more recently, after the impact of the economic crisis, but even before, because of the necessities that were linked to the monetary union that started in the 90s and then um, took uh, uh, around a decade before uh, being fully at work, well, these leaders started to meet more frequently. There were many issues to decide, to, to decide, to be settled, and so that's how the European Council has been constituted. It was just an informal meeting, now it has become a formal meeting, but because these people are very busy at home, they have to meet when it's absolutely necessary, because at Otherwise, the um, daily work is performed by the European Commission. So they're not there to monitor the daily work. They're not there to you know, monitor that everything is done according to the provision. This is the Commission that should do that. The European Council, by treaty, has to meet at least twice a year, which is very little. But when there are um, serious crises, Ukraine and Russia, or the economic crisis, I mean, these people have, meet, have met much more frequently in the past years because of the impact of the economic crisis on Europe. And so um, when they meet, they give guidance, they give uh, a medium and long-term agenda that the Commission then has to translate into acts. This medium and long term agenda has to be translated into decisions. And so because we know that the decision making process starts with the Commission, that's what the Commission is there for. Not only to listen to um, stimuli coming from the two chambers of the European uh, legislature, not only to listen to advisory bodies and interest groups when they propose legislation, but above all, they have to listen to the leaders, the political leaders of the member states who decide by consensus over the medium and long-term agenda of the EU by consensus, because it would not be possible for a union that is purely voluntarily, as the European Union is, to have winners and losers. Normally, at this level, where you have prime ministers, and in some cases, France in particular, you also have a president, well, it would not be acceptable that someone is always minority, that someone is always a loser. Their works are very secret, very confidential, um, and the operational mode of the European Council is consensus. How can you bring 28 uh, heads to agree? It's not easy. But this is the fascinating thing, I find. I mean, if this has worked in Europe, where again, there have been wars for thousands of years, and uh, um, 
probably all the good and bad has started in Europe in the sense that, I mean, much of modernity the way we know it, much of democracy we, the way we know it, has started in Europe. But also dictatorship, uh, also um, massacres, Nazism, fascism, so uh, the most cruel, violent ideologies have also started in Europe. So if in a continent that has been so troublesome for thousands of years, um, it has been possible to bring governments together to agree on a common agenda, leaders together, peoples together, uh, I think that there can be hope also for other parts of the world. I think this is the lesson to be learned. Um, we will discuss this in a minute. I mean, uh, this system is not ideal in the sense that it tries to accommodate many different views, many different interests. Consensus is often the only operational mode to make things go through. Otherwise, you would have stalemates. And definitely leadership is lacking, but could this be the solution also in many other areas? I think of uh, um, Asia, for example, but also Africa. Uh, I'm sure that also South America would be much more powerful if instead of uh, uh, mistrusting each other, countries like Argentina and Brazil would unite. So, what is so unique in the European Union is that it's purely experimental. Some say this is back to the empire, the Roman Empire, but it's not because actually this is a voluntary process and usually you don't have many examples of voluntary processes of same kind. Usually uh, you bring people together by use of force, so you impose a capital, you impose a language, you impose rules, but it's very, I mean, take the case of United States, that has not been a voluntary process, clearly, um, and very often um, nation building, state building are violent processes, and here instead it's uh, um, voluntarily and it's also um, promoting peace. Um, so, despite, uh, I agree this is weird and very much in progress because, I mean, in 10 years probably I'll be teaching European institutions and they will have changed again and they were slightly different 10 years ago, even more 20 years ago. So it's a moving target, it's not perfect, but I think there are achievements to be acknowledged. So I would like to know what you think of that. Any comment? So this is like a question or a concern, I guess. So yeah. getting the leaders of different countries is a one thing, but like there are different parties in like each country, right? So if let's say like the leaders of European Council yeah. has like one idea, so this one leader, but let's say this representative in this other parts like European Commission, like is from the same nation but has different like political ide ideals or economic like ideas, and that means that like even the re different representatives from different uh, th from the same country has different like ideas or purpose, so what happens in this case and will there be any like yeah. changes or improvements yeah. that will happen if such yeah. case happens? Yeah. Very nice questions because this confirms that the system can be weird at some point. Because it is true that when the European commissioners are appointed by the national governments, they are there to stay for five years and normally they're not removed. So if in the meanwhile there is a change in the national government, well, the new national government will not identify with the commissioner who was appointed by the previous government. 
this can happen. So, is it weird? Well, first of all, this um, guarantee that commissioners are not there to serve national interests. Remember what I said, this is the institution that is supposed to be there for the interest of everyone. The supranational interest is the mainly supranational institution. So commissioners, once they reach the European Commission, have to forget where they come from. <laughs> they are not representatives of the interests of their government. So, this is why if there is a change at the national level, this does not impact the composition of the Commission. At the same time, I have to say that um, the only way to uh, uh, come to terms with these situations is to develop a culture of consensus building. It's very rare to have confrontations, never confrontations in Europe. It doesn't pay. Confrontation usually um, is a lost battle. Sometimes it happens to the British to be very confrontational and very often they end up being in minority. So even for a country as big as UK, it can be, you know, very dangerous to keep this kind of temper. <laughs> Usually, the idea is we try to find solutions, we come to agreement, and uh, if this time there is someone who's not happy at 100%, next time they will be. But not proving loyal and instead exiting the decision is something that you would pay for ever and ever. There have been countries that have tried to forward a very aggressive conduct. It was the case of Poland, for example, some years ago. It didn't pay. They were isolated. In the end, they had to completely change their attitude and now they've become, you know, um, recognized in the EU and, uh, um, and also uh, their prime minister has taken a key post in the EU. The presidency of the EU. What is the presidency of the EU? It doesn't appear here. It's very recent, actually. The president of the EU is again appointed by the member states, like the president of the European Commission. But the president of the European Commission is there to, uh, to do the work of the Commission, which again is uh, the executive body. Mm? And he works like a sort of independent agency, if you want. Okay, So that's what the president is there for. And the president of the EU is a broader figure. Before there was a rotating presidency, six months for every member state. And in those six months, the member state would host all the meetings and organize the agenda of all the meetings, for example, the meeting of the European Council. But if there is not someone who follows all these works for a little bit longer, it doesn't work well. So now we have a president who lasts for two and a half years. Again, remember, he's appointed by the member states, so he must be someone the member states trust. And now this role is with the former prime minister of Poland to show how much this country has become more prominent within the EU. Have I answered your question? Okay. Any other one? Um, hi. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned previously in your example of the kind of policies that the European Commission sets forth that, for example, an environmentalist group would, or an environmental lobby would cause a proposal to be set forth by the European Commission. Is, 
who, I was wondering who sets the who sets the agenda for the policy cycle of the European Commission, and are they in any way susceptible to lobbyist groups that could be formed by uh, different coalitions of EU countries and or something like that? Okay. Uh, you know that Brussels is the place that the place that has largest concentration of lobbies on earth, more than Washington DC. In number, there are more. Uh, usually they work as unions of countries, as you said, because it would not make sense to have environmentalists from every single member state. Also, it would be very costly but also not very efficient. Instead, I mean, it takes a mass of people in order to count. So you have these um, lobby groups in Brussels that are very multicultural, I have to say, um, multi-language with uh, members and representatives from the different member states. And um, the European Union is um, a system very much open to uh, lobbies. Uh, more than many member states. Imagine, for example, that here in Italy you can't have contacts with MPs. You can't have physical contacts, not even if you have a pass. You can't enter their hall. If you have a pass, they bring you, you know, like in theaters, you have these pigeon holes. And same thing um, in the Italian parliament, because it is really designed in order not to have contacts between citizens, even organized citizens and politicians. And the European Union is completely different. The European Commission is accessible. The parliament is particularly accessible. We will see that when we will visit um, the EU institutions, we will show you how easy it is to step in. I mean, you can even, you can easily access, I mean, there are just problems of security, but if you get a pass and you get easily one, once in, you can step in, you know, knock at the door, talk to MPs, um, attend their committees, and that works, and it's a fascinating experience because um, the whole works are multi-language and there is um, translation. So you see how different it is to, to work at the European level because of course the process is lowered down by the language barrier. There are only very few who accept to use the international language like English and French. Uh, but the other ones use their own language and there is translation and also visitors would um, listen to the translation. Um, and lobbies can step in everywhere. And so you said, how does the agenda of lobbies fit the um, agenda of the European Union? So we have a medium long term agenda that is, that is decided by the European Council. So if the European Council has decided to reduce pollution, it would be very weird from the European Commission to you know, uh, accept the recommendation of a lobbyist group about uh, increasing pollution. The European Commission would have to report to the European Council, so it doesn't work that way. And also it will be stopped, of course, in the process by the other two bodies. So medium long term agenda settled by the European Council, but this is broad. It's also made of uh, broad principles. Uh, then the European Commission makes its own evaluations that also have to take into consideration that what is proposed uh, doesn't go against the interest of someone. It is in the interest of everyone, it is in the supranational interest, doesn't create, doesn't create divisions within Europe. And then, uh, if this is settled, draft a proposal that will then be voted by the Parliament and the Council of the EU. And the process can be stopped at any time. If only one of the two chambers does not agree, throw out. Okay. There can be many reasons why the Council, again, agree and the Parliament does not, or the other way around. Because again, remember that in the European Parliament you have 
MPs, who are directly elected by the citizens, they're party officials, they belong to different ideologies, but in the Council of the EU you have ministers, so they have to report once back home to the government. If you go there and negotiate um, measures that are um, that are uh, uh, negative for your country, this is something your government will have to justify with their voters, with the public opinion. So they have to be very careful about protection of national interests. So national interests disappear from the European Commission, uh, party ideologies disappear from the European Commission, but step in through Parliament and Council of the EU. Okay, any other one? What responsibility or role um, does the EU play in international crises such as the crisis in Ukraine? Very little, I have to say. Um, there are some policy fields that are very difficult to integrate. Everything has started with the economy, because the economy was the most, uh, let's say, evident in a way, creating a common market with so many consumers is something that can prove beneficial to many. We trade most of our goods, not only Italy, but all the member states within the EU. So this has created enormous advantages. Um, but when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to um, you know, uh, ethics like um, civil rights, um, immigration, this is much more difficult to integrate. So I could say that foreign policy is probably the least integrated among the policy fields. Justice is another one. And uh, the reason is that you have so many nasty interests and so many different um, historical backgrounds. You have Britain, you have France, and then you have the losers of the Second World War, like Italy and Germany. Um, and then you have countries that played you know, a prominent role in the past, although it was centuries ago, like um, Spain, for example. And then you have uh, former communist countries, so Eastern European countries, who have borders in common with Russia and so feel the external threat in a way that is completely different from us. So you have so many different cultures and interests that really it's very difficult to integrate foreign policy. So there is a dipl diplomatic service of the EU, but for example, the EU is not represented as a single entity within the United Nations. I mean, within the um, Security Council of the United Nations, you have France, you have Britain, but you don't have the EU. So the EU usually doesn't really um, have the last say for the Europeans. And when the Europeans divide, uh, everyone goes on their own. It was the case of the war in Iraq. The British decided to go, the French absolutely no, the same with the Germans. Um, the Italians first said yes, then said no, <laughs> were a bit indecisive. The Spanish said first yes and then no. So you also have, you also have countries that are exposed to crises of which have no experience because there are countries that do not have recent experience of uh, um, you know such critical international politics and when it comes to deciding whether you know to attack intervene or not uh, even changes at the national level changes uh, in the government at the national level can have an influence while on the contrary France and Britain tend to have more unitary policy, foreign policy. I've answered your question. So basically, no, I mean, it exists on paper, but really um, uh, foreign policy is not a field so much integrated. 
But one interesting thing, uh, if I were abroad in a non-EU country and there was not um, an Italian embassy, I could go to any of the European embassies of the members of the European Union and should be welcome and, you know, should be assisted and so on. This is thanks to the European Union. I mean, it's not much of a problem in the United States, but of course, if you're traveling um, in Africa or in Asia, you know, that could be, that could be relevant. Any other? Um, so I know in the US, they had problems um, deciding on the power of the states based on population. Mm -hmm. And with the various countries in the EU, and like various population sizes, do they have similar problems? Okay, so look, as I said, the European Commission has one commissioner for each country. So this is a problem that has been settled this way. You have an incredible disproportion because you have one commissioner for the Germans, who are 80 millions, and one for Malta, that is only 350,000. But that's, I guess, uh, the golden rule of federalism. You cannot just uh, uh, forget about the small ones, because otherwise, especially in a voluntarily um, process, as the EU process is, uh, they wouldn't find convenient to be in. So you have to give them power of influence. The same thing in the Council of the European Union, because remember, this is made of the ministers of the different member states. So we say Council of the European Union, but there could be a S, councils, because they meet depending on the policy field. So you will have the um, ministers of the economy of the member states who meet, they don't meet with ministers from other fields. They meet only with their fellow colleagues. And this is the ECOFIN, economic and finance. And this is the most important, probably. And there you have one minister for every member state. And then you will have one for the other policy fields. Again, environment. OK? So, you see, in these two institutions, you have representatives from every member state, no matter the size. Same thing with the European Council, because there you have the chief executives of every member state to set the medium and long term agenda. Finally, the parliament. That is more tricky, because this is where citizens vote. So, how do you accommodate the size issue? There is an over-representation of the smaller ones and a lower representation of the bigger ones. So the bigger ones have more seats, uh, like Italy has around 70, and uh, Germany um, has around the same. There has been a balance in the sense they didn't want Germany uh, you know, to, uh, um, to have too much weight compared to Britain, France, Italy. So the big countries all have more or less the same number of seats, uh, but then the small ones do not disappear. Okay? So there is a balancing. This is the idea. Okay. So, before we move on to other questions or comments, I would like to briefly conclude. We have the European Court of Justice, but I don't think there are too many words to spend here. You're, you know what the high courts are, and this is the high court of the European Union, so they have to uh, look after uh, implementation. Uh, well, more the implementation respect, because it's not a political thing. I mean, the European Commission is there really to monitor daily that the um, EU laws are implemented, but then if there are uh, let's say breaks to the um, uh, let's say to the uh, law system of the European Union, then there is the uh, European Court of Justice who intervenes. It is also interesting to know that individual citizens can appeal to the European Court of Justice. So if you feel that something uh, bad was done to you uh, and that you have right of EU citizens that have not been respected, like I go to any country and I feel that uh, uh, I am discriminated, 
arrested mm, as a European citizen, I can appeal to the European Court of Justice. So if there's, let's say, a serious problem of breach mm, of the uh, EU law system that also, um, that also uh, comprehends um, a number of provisions in favor of uh, uh, mobility of people, rights of citizens. So if ever there's a breach uh, of those um, provisions, um, anyone can appeal to the European Court of Justice. And then the European Court of Auditors that has to check the um, uh, spending of the uh, uh, European institutions. This has to be sound. In the past there have been some problems here and there, problems of uh, um, corruption and uh, this has been sanctioned. Unfortunately, the European Court of Auditors did not realize in time, but since I think the lesson has been learned, so they monitor how the money is spent by the European institutions. So uh, this, I, I think, I'm not sure you can read really well, but basically you have here uh, a number of uh, points that I have already discussed. Um, who are the people forming the different uh, bodies? Uh, how are they elected? What are they there for? Where are they based? And so on. If you want, I can then circulate these um, slides, but uh, um, everything that is here I have already um, mentioned. So finally, the EU, more supranational or more intergovernmental? Is it a question about reality? So is it an assessment about reality? Is the European Union more intergovernmental or more supranational? Or is it prospective? How should it be? Should it be more intergovernmental? Should it be more supranational. I think both questions apply because um, we have to care about um, where we're going from here. We know what a European Union is, although not always it is easy to understand. I mean, you understand a complex system like this is difficult to monitor, especially for the average citizen. I mean, average citizen know about what happens with their national government, but to know what is happening in Brussels is way more difficult. To get information, to understand, to, you know, um, interact in a multi-language setting. So, um, where are we going? Should Europe become more supranational? So this means national interests should not count um, there should not be veto power of the national governments and, uh, you know, we should feel a unitary whole and as such there shouldn't be, you know, veto pled by uh, uh, different members. And if there are losers within this game, well, that's democracy, majority and minority. For the time being, you see the system has been shaped in a way to guarantee that there's either no minorities or there is a minimization of minority. Consensus is more the rule. So, what is the forecast? What is the European going to be like? Can it become something like the United States where you have uh, winners and losers? This would imply no more intergovernmentalism, only supranationalism, and we should become a real federation with some guarantees, of course, for the different members so that the small ones do not disappear, those who are most peripheral do not disappear, those who are poorer still count. But at the same time, the, sh the, the rule should be accepted that, you know, in this kind of community, there would be a majority and a minority. Or should we instead keep the system as it is nowadays, where intergovernmentalism matters? a lot. What is your opinion about that?
I think the European Union best serves its function as an intergovernmental mm -hmm. um, institution because, I mean, what I know about the European Union, Union is it's hard to have a democracy when there's different languages and there's different interests and there's different cultures and there's different histories. And there's just, I mean, there's a lot that unites Europe, but at the same time, it's different than the US in that they don't have any common holidays. They don't have a common language. They don't have, at least most of them, they don't have a common history. And I think because of that, it's hard to have a really democratic institution that's representative of all the countries and, yeah, having laws that, um, you know, exceed the, the national laws. I don't think that's, I don't think that would serve the purpose. Does everybody share this point of view? Or should the EU move a step further? So there should be more more of a community, more of a polity, we say, in political science. Yeah, there should be a political community that although multi-language, although um, with different um, historical backgrounds, uh, should consider itself as a federation like the United States with uh, a central government that decides some degree of um, decentralization but a lot of centralization in the federal government with majority rule. So I think like the ideal, ideal pers perspective, perspective will be if they can act like the United States and, uh, and move towards the way that can benefit like entire country. But I think realistically that would be not, that would not really be possible if they don't like change their path right now because like in the future the like either economically or politically the gap between like different European nations will definitely like increase and some countries will be more like wealthier and some countries will be poorer or even decline mm -hmm. in a sense so like if that keeps if that goes on we'll definitely there definitely will be a phenomenon where some countries will have like drastically more power, like political and economic power over other European nations. So that will lead to more like more w uh, towards a way that kind of deviates from the original like purpose of mm -hmm. EU, I guess. Okay, so you tend to agree with your colleague, but is there anyone who thinks differently? Who thinks that really we, would move, we should move one step further and uh, uh, become more united? Um, <coughs> I think that European Union should um, be, uh, push further and become a more supranational uh, organization. The reason is, um, as as people said in front, um, there are different histories, different languages among the countries. But also this problem can be solved if um, we can set up a system just like simply we have um, two chambers or we can have um, countries with bigger population with more votes, just like Senate or um, the House, um, like two houses in the United States. And in this way, the countries in Europe can have more connections. And like during the time of crisis, it would be more effective to make decisions uh, other than it would take a really long process uh, when facing a crisis. Um, either in the European Union or like close to the European Union. Mm. So to make integ integration deeper in order to make the EU more powerful, more efficient, that's a possibility. I mean, uh, some say that there's no future for Europe if not deeply united, deeply integrated, because so many small states there, there are, and now the process is more about big powers, superpowers. 
So the only way for countries, even those with um, a past history of uh, influence, think for example of Great Britain, think of France, would not have same influence uh, if it was not through the European Union. Many think that the way for this country to flourish in their power of influence is to do that through a continent of over 500 million with one of the lar largest economies in the world with strategic power. So, uh, let's say, uh, those who criticize the state of integration are very divided. There are those who believe that integration has already gone too much further and should step back, maybe give money back to, sorry, money, powers back, including money, <laughs> to the member states. And those who think instead the obstacles is nested interests that are represented and that block the process through veto. So the problem is intergovernmentalism. Move one step further, have a real supranational entity, and then your Europe will become bigger and bigger. So there are the two opposite viewpoints. And of course, there is not a final solution. But I would say that um, Europe is very much divided in, even in terms of public opinion. It is internally divided in countries like Italy, but overall Italy tends to be a country where there is more predisposition towards supranationalism, probably because we don't have a long history of a united country. You know that Italy has become a united state only in the 1860s, so it's quite, it's quite late. Um, at the same time, we do not have the same um, history of uh, uh, imperialism, colonial powers like Britain and France. So probably for these reasons, we see ourselves as a small or middle rank power, and so we're more ready to accept, to delegate sovereignty and become part of a supranational entity. But of course, uh, sentiments in Britain are very much different. Their public opinion tends to be more eurosceptical, as we say, to the point that there is now a discussion about holding a referendum in Britain in a couple of years about exiting the European Union. Because one thing they do not accept is that the European Union has uh, become, you know, so much integrated that this implies decisions over many, many policy fields and not always the British agree with th those decisions, but as I said, because it's very difficult for, you know, a naughty boy <laughs> to uh, reverse things, uh, very, very often they're a minority and they have still to implement what has been decided by others. They have to succumb many times. And so they don't want to stay in anymore. I mean, I'm not saying everyone, but uh, let's say public opinion is um, uh, at over 60% uh, in favor of exiting the European Union. So it's a large majority. Um, so it depends on the country. Some countries are, inter are internally divided about what to do. Some others are more, let's say, united about views on Europe, they can be pessimistic, they can be optimistic, but of course we have not reached a perfect equilibrium. The, the process is uh, uh, very much in the making. So um, I think it's very fascinating. I feel privileged to be uh, you know, a citizen of Europe experiencing all this, but also to be an observer who can study these processes. And I think that also students have a great opportunity to see something that is so unique and so much evolving. I really would like if uh, you kept this one of your privileged uh, field of research in the future. It's um, something that uh, is not very common to find in American departments whose interests are so much shifted to other areas of the world. So 
this opportunity you have here is to, uh, let's say, open the mind a little bit and see something that is uh, complicated. Um, it also has costs, but pays benefits um, for sure in terms of peace. Do you think it's possible that in part of the EU, in some decision-making um, institution that can be supranational and other parts can be intergovernmental? Yeah, this is, this is a bit the case and has always been the case actually because the European Commission is supranational, as we said. The Council of the EU is intergovernmental and the same with the European Council, right? What is interesting is that the parliament is moving a bit because before it was more kind of organized on national basis in the sense that the Italians who go there will group together and the French will group together. And, but now things are changing and um, often the Italians have to vote against other Italians because they stand in different you know, um, different sides, left and right. So, uh, being a national of your country is not guiding you in your voting decision in the parliament. And also, the group they belong to, so parties or Euro parties, as they are called, also sanction those who defect. Imagine that some research has been carried. The American members of the Congress defect their own parties more, the, more than the members of the European Parliament do. This is interesting, isn't it? You talked before about language, about culture and so on, but then the congressmen split and defect from the party line, are not loyal to their party, despite all this um, cultural cohesion. And on the contrary, uh, in the European Parliament, there is more and more cohesiveness within parties that are so much multinational, multicultural. So I think the European Parliament is probably the most interesting of these institutions to study because I think it is moving toward supranationalism. So, I don't know if this answers your question, but you see um, some institutions have been designed to be either supranational or intergovernmental, and the European Parliament is swift and in between, but probably moving more decisively towards the supranational uh, pole. And that would change a bit the equilibria, I find. Any other one? Yeah, I guess this is going to be the last question. Um, you spoke earlier about the EU lacking a personality and lacking an identity. Um, but when you look at the case of Turkey, who's wanted to be a part of the EU for a long time now, um, and the EU does not want them to be a part largely because the majority of the population is Muslim. Um, and so when considering this, to what extent does there already exist an EU personality um, that countries that are part of the EU have to um, embody to an extent. Hmm. I, would love to, I would love to talk about the case of Turkey for hours and hours because I find it so fascinating. Turkey has applied to become a member and the main reason or justification for not being allowed in is democracy. Uh, in particular respect of human rights. Uh, there was a very serious problem in uh, Turkey with uh, a minority, the Kurds, um, in the past. Then improvements have been made thanks to the um, um, European, um, to the European uh, pressures. Um, so, the justification is democracy, it's not the economy, because Turkey is, a, is in much better shape than many other member states, and it is growing fast. Many European states are not. And, uh, you know, it is ranking higher uh, in terms of uh, 
their economy than Romania, Bulgaria. So in economic terms, it would be very advantageous to have them in. Now, is this issue of uh, civil rights, uh, uh, let's say, just make up for other things? There have been countries that have um, resisted to uh, accession of Turkey. Italy, for example, is very much in favor. I don't know if it's Mediterranean neighboring, I don't know, but the uh, Muslim issue is not really an issue for the Italian government, despite Italy is a very Catholic country. But this seems to be an issue for the French, um, not because France is a confessional state, on the contrary, uh, France is a state where nobody is allowed to wear a cross in schools and public places. I mean, pupils have to be sent back home or take off, you know, whatever religious sign they have. It could be a veil, it could be a cross, whatever. It's a state law. So that's, let's say, secularism at its extreme. And so they complain that Turkey is not and uh, that it is moving more and more towards Islamization of society and Islamization of public sphere. In particular, the prime minister is a, well, um, he's a church attendant. So um, for Germany, it was another reason. The largest Turkish community outside Turkey is in Germany. And they fear that so young Turkish population is, because we have a birth rate of, you know, negative birth rate in the European countries, but not in Turkey. Well, they fear that if ever Turkey would be let in, you would have flows of Turkish migrants um, reaching uh, their families in Germany. And these are huge... Um, costs of domestic politics because of uh, uh, racism, because of uh, um, the sense of antipathy some may have towards uh, minorities, you know, the idea that the migrants, the immigrants are stealing uh, the works to the residents. I mean, it's the same thing of uh, everywhere. I mean, you've heard that hundreds of time in uh, uh, the United States and I'm sure the same in Canada. So the same thing, but because Germany will be so much exposed, the German government has opposed that. So when you have two countries like Germany and France that for different reasons object, well, it's gonna be hard. And the result is that they're keeping Turkey waiting and waiting for ages and in the end they will get tired, I guess. Okay, guys, it was very interesting. Thank you for the interesting conversation. Thank you.